Good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Sustainable Materials Chemistry webinar on innovation. We are st starting this webinar um, with an introduction to innovation concepts. My name is Blake Hallman and I will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series of innovation webinars put on by the Student Council for Innovation, which is a student and postdoc led team within the CSMC. From today's webinar, we hope to inform the graduate students and postdocs about how they can develop Sorry for that. Um, from today's webinar, we hope to inform graduate students and postdocs about how they can develop an idea or an how they can develop an idea or an observation that they see in the lab and turn it into a markable innovation. It is my great pleasure today to introduce you to three panelists, uh, Ken Vaughn, Paul Hipmeyer, and Eric Evett, who are joining us today for, with a large background in uh, innovation. The format for today's webinar will uh, start with general questions for our two panelists, for our three panelists, each will receive two questions and we'll have three to four minutes to respond. We will then open the webinar up to a live Q&A with the audience. And after that, we will allow our guest speakers to provide some summarizing points and provide a take home message. With that, I'll introduce our three panelists today. Our first panelist is Ken Vaughn, who is from Oregon Best. Ken manages Oregon Best commercialization funding activities that leads to the investment of about 1.5 million per year. He also manages 40 existing investments and collaborates with innovators, investors, mentors, and support organizations and senior management talent. Before joining Oregon Best, he held at senior management positions in engineering, product management, and marketing in wide range industries. He has experience in managing innovation, starting companies, advising early stage companies and investing in early stage ventures. Our second panelist for today is Eric Evett. Eric has more than 30 years of catalysis, chemical and chemical process R&D and R&D management experience. His expertise includes an intellectual property assessment, process development and intercompany joint R&D where he has held various positions including senior management. Eric completed his PhD in chemistry at the California Institute of Technology and was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. More recently, he obtained his registration as a U.S. patent agent in 2011. Our next panelist is Paul Hippenmeyer, who is a business development manage manager in the Office of Technology Management at Washington University in St. Louis. Excuse me. Um, Paul was responsible for evaluating the university's generated technologies for patentability, marketability, and licensing of promising technologies to incorporate into these. Prior to joining Washington University, Paul was a senior licensing and business development associate at the University of Missouri Columbia. Paul has 20 plus years in pharma bio and biotech drug discovery space with senior scientific leadership roles in several therapeutic areas and in technology development. Paul has a PhD in cellular and molecular biology from St. Louis University. Lastly, my name is Blake Common, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Chemistry at Washington University in St. Louis. I received my master's in physical organic chemistry from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville and my bachelor's degree in chemistry from Blackburn College. I currently work for Sophia Hayes at Washington University where my research focuses on the solid state and MR characterization of inorganic metal oxide precursors and their corresponding thin films used for materials device applications. The, for, the next um, session of our uh, webinar today is general questions. We will begin with uh, Ken Vaughn. Ken, can you give us a quick um, definition of what is innovation? Sure, Blake, and uh, hello to everybody today, and a special hello to those of you uh, down in Corvallis. I uh, look forward to connecting you with, it, with you at some point. 
So I guess you know innovation is a, a term that gets thrown around a lot. Um, it's a, a little bit squishy. It probably has no agreed to definition or <laughs> or has maybe many definitions depending on the context. Um, you know, some might say it's um, something as simple as you know just a new idea or um, a new uh, device or new process or it's a, a significant positive change or something along that line. Um, uh, but again, the, you know, the connotation is important whether we're talking about it in a business context or an academic context or maybe a public institution context or a social context. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll give you my definition, but I would say it's a, you know, innovation is a word that gets kind of overused in, in the corporate world and gets a little bit devalued. Sometimes, you know, people are really talking about an improvement or an invention, which doesn't, doesn't really meet my definition of what an innovation is. Um, so my definition might be something along these lines, that innovation is the combination and the application of ideas, intellect, hard work, and resources in a new way that creates significant value by solving a problem or exploiting a new opportunity. And I, another important thing to think about is sometimes innovations are sort of a series of incremental things that are sort of evolutionary and sometimes they're discontinuous or sort of a breakthrough or a, a revolutionary innovation. So one, one important note there in my mind is it, it's not an innovation unless it can be realized or applied in some fashion to, to add value. And that, you know, that value might be for the benefit of a single company, in which case it's usually resulting in a new product or a new process or some kind of a competitive advantage. And depending on the value that, that the company gets from the innovation, uh, you know, most of that might be passed on to their customers in the form of a better, cheaper, faster product or some, some product innovation. It's also important to note that the more significant the innovation is in terms of generating revenue or profit or market share for the company, the company is going to value it very highly. And they'll usually attempt to protect it with patents or trade secrets or non-compete agreements or other kinds of competitive barriers. You know, sometimes an innovation is not just for the benefit of one company. It might be for an entire industry, especially if it's widely available and widely adopted. And sometimes innovations also have multiplier or network effects when one innovation is combined with another. You know, you know for example, the, the integrated circuit gave rise to the microcomputer you know, in a similar time frame. DARPANET and I gave rise to the internet, and then the combination of those things gave rise to what we now think of as the World Wide Web and uh, cloud computing and lots of other um, applications that we all use today. So, you know, one, one note on that is I mentioned the DARPANET, uh, which gave rise to the internet. So that was an innovation that came out of really a, a governmental funding. And so innovations happen in all kinds of places. They happen in, in industry. They happen just in somebody's uh, uh, garage. They happen in universities. They happen in national labs or other uh, non-commercial or pre-commercial institutions. And so there's a lot of different places where innovation is taking place. So I guess in my definition, you know, it's not, it's not good enough to just be novel or new or different. Uh, it must be something that has the characteristics that lead it to the adoption Related to adoption and, and to value creation. And maybe one last thought on uh, the definition would be that when it comes to product innovation, the, the best thinking these days is that it's, it's really best derived uh, from lots of interaction with potential customers to really understand what their problems are, what their pain points are, what the competitive dynamics are in their industry as opposed to just thinking, of, you know, kind of that you can just sort of dream things up in the lab. I, I think in reality it's sort of the combination of the dreaming in the lab and the interacting with customers that gets the best results. Thank you, Ken, for, for that, for that uh, definition. Our next question will be for uh, Eric Evett. Eric, what are three key steps to starting the innovation process? Uh, thank you, and uh, let me also uh, acknowledge uh, our audience. And uh, 
say that I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Uh, insofar as uh, Ken just gave us a nice perspective, I think, on what innovation is, then for purposes of my remarks, I'm going to uh, condense that and uh, acknowledge that, uh, given what he said, the process of innovation uh, can then, I think, be considered the process of using uh, that intellect, that hard work. Uh, and for me, summarizing it is using new knowledge or existing knowledge in a new way, as uh, Ken said, to solve a problem for commercial or public benefit. And <clears throat> so when we think how do we uh, start the innovation process, um, let me first uh, acknowledge, I don't know how many members of this audience are members of CSMC and have, therefore, or will participate in Ecospecies uh, Lens on the Market workshop called Research to Innovation. Uh, I myself haven't participated in that workshop, nor have I seen any of the curriculum materials. Nevertheless, um, this is a shout out to that curriculum because my guess is that this question that I've been presented with here is asking me to do in about two and a half minutes what that workshop does in eight hours. So uh, I'm going to share, in fact, four uh, key steps that I think uh, are critical to starting the innovation process and uh, encourage you to follow up uh, perhaps with this uh, workshop that's accessible to you. Uh, as you consider it further. Um, remember then that starting the innovation process is about connecting knowledge with a problem in such a way as to deliver a meaningful solution that was not previously available. Um, and so before you connect the knowledge with the problem, you need both the knowledge and the problem. And I think this is worth noting because especially within the academic context within which most of this audience resides at the present time, we tend to be naturally and, and more consistently focused on the knowledge because that's what graduate and postdoctoral research is all about, you know, generating knowledge, um, in fact, developing the skills by which one can create new knowledge. Um, <clears throat> So often in this environment, the audience may not be as focused on the problem side of it. And therefore, I'd say a key first step is to cultivate an attitude of attention to problems. Uh, at least uh, for some, this comes very naturally. For others, uh, their uh, enthusiasm for and contribution to a particular field is, is driven primarily by their intrinsic curiosity uh, and their pursuit of the knowledge for its own sake. And they may or may not be so focused on problems to which that knowledge might be applicable. So I really do think that uh, particularly early stage in people's career in an academic setting, it's important to start paying more attention to problems. Uh, Next uh, step, innovation requires uh, that one select and define a problem. And one's choice of problem will automatically and perhaps intuitively be guided by at least two complementary considerations. One is an assessment of your chances of successfully solving the problem. And you're not generally going to take on a problem that you think is impossible to solve and also an assessment of the benefits that you anticipate might flow from solving that problem. Um, both of uh, those uh, considerations, I think, need uh, some more in-depth study, and this really picks up on something that Ken already said, and that's the third step is to vet the prospective solution to the problem. And 
often this is uh, initially a thought experiment. It's essentially asking if I had the knowledge that I think I need to solve the problem, would I really solve it? And would I deliver the benefits that I seek? And it's, it's this inquiry that's generally a highly multidisciplinary inquiry and as Ken mentioned, involves uh, trying to connect with and, and learn what one can about uh, the, the real needs of the people who would use the solution to the problem, that is the customers, the marketplace. And two things generally come out of this, this uh, thought experiment and, and this vetting analysis. And in my experience, one is that you find that you don't really understand the problem as well as you thought you did and it's much more nuanced, and therefore the requirements for a workable, useful solution are uh, more and more nuanced. And you also realize how much you still need to learn in order to implement a solution that anyone would care about. Uh, that is either pay for or use in place of a solution that they've already got. Um, so, you want at this stage to then develop a sense of what the successful solution would look like because I'd say the fourth step then is one needs to outline and implement the program that would be required to develop or acquire the rest of the knowledge in addition to what's already in hand or practicable by you could be acquired from somewhere else required to solve the problem and deliver the value you seek. So those are four of the steps to, I would say, get going towards innovating by combining knowledge with problem. Thank you, Eric. Our next question is for Paul. And, um, Paul comes from us comes to us from an academic institution. So, Paul, how do you start the innovation process if you're if you're at an academic institution? Yeah, thanks, Blake, and, and welcome everybody. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, yeah, let me frame this in the academic uh, mindset a little bit. Uh, uh, the first uh, Ken and Eric both gave great overviews and explanations of the process and and the definitions and things. And uh, so I want to bring it down to, you know, here I am in the lab working on a project that maybe I thought of myself or maybe my mentor uh, handed to me. Uh, but anyway, um, it's often very focused, as was said, on the, the acquisition of knowledge and not so much on the application of it. And so first thing we have to realize is that, uh, one, the university you're at probably doesn't make much stuff. You know, they, they, that's not their business. Their business is education, research. Uh, they're not into manufacturing sales. They don't have the infrastructure to sell product. Uh, they don't have the manufacturing capabilities to mass produce many things. They can, you know, with the 3D printing and things these days, there's, you can make uh, lab scale prototypes, but uh, maybe not much beyond that. So one, the university that doesn't make stuff. So stuff that comes from your lab that might solve somebody's problem, uh, we have to find an outlet for that. And so at the end of the day, your tech transfer person needs to find what we call a licensee. So that licensee will be an established company. So it's out there already making product. Uh, maybe it's a huge company, maybe it's a very small company, but it's, it's a third party that will take that, that idea, that concept, those materials that you've generated in your laboratories and, and make something of it. Um, and the other way we do it is uh, to form a startup company. So oftentimes the idea is very, very young, very uh, early in its conception, not a whole lot of proof of concept. If we want to get it to the marketplace, I can go to established companies, but they'll come back and say, hey, Paul, that's that's pretty cool stuff, but, you know, it's so risky right now. I've got a bunch of in-house projects I 
I know much better. Uh, we're going to move with those and uh, you know come back to me when you've got a little bit more development behind it. So that's great. So either the academic lab does the development, which is often rare, or uh, we can form a startup company, sometimes with the inventors, uh, sometimes without the inventors as founders, but uh, uh, certainly in close association with the inventors to take that early concept and as we say, de-risk it to make it more attractive to the uh, to the bigger fish out there in the commercial space. And so at the end of the day, uh, your tech transfer person has to do a licensing deal. And then as was touched on earlier, um, you have to attract these these other companies to sort of take the bait and uh, and pick up your technology. And so why would they do that? A, it's been mentioned, uh, uh, because this will give them a competitive advantage in the marketplace. And so that's you know, that's really why they're going to do it. They're not going to do it because it's cool, because it's got a lot of bells and whistles and, and, and looks neat. Uh, you're solving a problem for them. And so you, you as students and postdocs, uh, uh, young, young faculty members, you want to be able to try to focus on what's, what's that unmet need in the marketplace. What are the people in this space, particularly the companies in the space, what are they trying to do? What's the next product that they're trying to come up with? And so that's that's sort of the mindset you want to get. And it's, uh, frankly, it's hard. I mean, you're <laughs> you're very focused on getting your thesis done, uh, you know, trying to get some publications out, uh, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's almost a, a third dimension of what you're doing. But uh, uh, it can be done, and, and people do it all the time. Uh, but it is, is it takes a little bit different mindset, and it is hard. So I would encourage you to go out, start networking. Uh, there are translational grants at some of your universities, so they're specifically set up to take kind of that early idea to the next step. So they'll give you, you know, some funding, usually not a whole lot, but it's a little bit to get those next few experiments done to de-risk the project. Uh, team up with people in the business school, so they often have business plan competitions. Uh, team up with them, get involved in business plan competitions. It'll teach you a ton about business and running a business and startups and things you need to think about from the commercial side. And then finally, uh, as you go to conferences and meetings, usually there's a large vendor section out there. You know, just troll, troll around the booth since, you know, A, you always look and see what their new products are, but B, you can ask those people, hey, you know, what's next? You know, what are you trying to solve? What would your next product look like? And think about that in context of what you're doing in the lab, and you know, maybe you'll run into that into that vendor who's got a problem that you might be able to solve uh, and look at it that way. So anyway, um, lots of things you can do. It's uh, uh, it's a very different sort of process, and it, but it does take time and effort. Uh, to do, but it's but it is doable. Thanks, Paul. Our next question um, is for Ken. Um, Ken, what are some of the technical, financial, commercial, and organizational obstacles that have to be overcome to bring an in innovation to the marketplace? Yeah. So I guess the first thing I would say is. Um, there are a lot of obstacles. Um, you know, my experience in working in both big companies and in small companies and startup companies is that bringing an innovation to market is difficult under the best of circumstances. <laughs> and so it um, it requires a you know a certain diligence and determination and um, and it's also helpful you know to understand what the obstacles are and and so you can anticipate them and. Uh, work your way through them. Um, so I guess the first, my first thought would be, it's important to in bringing something to market, not just to figure out how does it work, but to also figure out how does it win, how does it win in the marketplace. And so you know the you know the how does it work part I think comes more naturally to those of us who have an engineering or scientific background. Uh, the how does it win is a little bit different story, um, and you really have to think about you know how does this innovation compete with uh, solutions that are available to to customers, and you know sometimes they have competing products, 
that they can uh, look at, or sometimes they can just continue doing the way they do things now. There's always a, a certain inertia in businesses around using the things they're familiar with and already have everybody trained on. And so, you know, to win in the marketplace, you, you really have to be thinking about things that are really compelling enough that they can uh, can not only work but also win. So just some of the, you know, some of the technical obstacles I think would be, you know, the first one would be just making the core technology or the or the core science work effectively and reliably. Um, there's usually at the heart of any innovation or any product, there's some some core technology that really is sort of the essence of the innovation, and it has to meet certain uh, performance standards. Uh, it has to be uh, reliable. It has to be repeatable, and uh, that's really where the hardcore engineering and science comes in. And then another technical obstacle is, uh, that, you know, now that you think you've you've figured out the, the core technology and, and it works, is you have to make sure that the technology can be scaled up uh, to meet the size of the demand. And you know, in some cases, the demand may not be may not be a huge issue, but in other cases, it's a big it's a big deal. And you know, the difference between making something work on a small scale and a medium scale and a big scale, there can be a, a series of, of new innovations that are required. Uh, to make that happen. So it's important to be thinking about that in terms of especially things that might have a big market that you really have to be thinking about the scale-up process as well. And then the other thing would be uh, taking that core technology and turning it into a real product. Usually the, a product is not just the core technology. Uh, it's the core technology that's uh, you know packaged in a certain way and has you know certain interfaces or uh, usability issues. And you have to be thinking about how you know how that that technology can be packaged, how it can be distributed, uh, and in some cases it might need to be certified or it might require permits uh, or other things that uh, have to be addressed that are part of those uh, technical obstacles. So when it comes to uh, commercial obstacles, uh, you know some of those would be you know the, the first would be would be can you can you produce the product at a cost? That results in a price that customers will pay. Uh, if you know if customers aren't going to buy it, then it's really not going to get adopted. Uh, and also, uh, can that can the economics work such that not only will customers pay for it, but that there will be a margin, a profit margin left between the the price and the cost that results in a profit that the business can accept. And that's kind of important on the front end as well in terms of whether the business will even invest in in developing the innovation because the business wants to see that there is a profit that's going to offset that cost. So another commercial obstacle would be sort of making sure that the features and the functions and the usability of the product is something uh, that customers will like. And one thing that a lot of engineers and scientists struggle with when it comes to innovation is, is uh, Coming up with things that they like, that engineers like, <laughs> or uh, but maybe the broad uh, customer base that the product is intended for may not like, um, and that, that's it's sort of a, a mindset thing that you have to you have to recognize who the real end users of this innovation would be, what do they think is important versus what you think is important, uh, and so there's there's an expression you might hear from your uh, colleagues in business school, and, and that's the question is, you know, will the dogs eat the dog food? Uh, and you know, sometimes um, as engineers, you you develop things and you make them work a certain way that's very comfortable for an engineer, but but sort of the the, the normal consumer uh, really doesn't like it. Uh, and you have to you have to take a different approach, and you have to really understand how the how they think about uh, the product. And then I think the other thing is you have to be sure on the commercial side that there, that the product has enough competitive differenti differentiation, you know, has to be different enough from other solutions and, and, and advantages to beat out, as I mentioned before, products from other companies uh, or, you know, just inertia. And sometimes it's not just about the product. The competing products in the marketplace might be inferior in some way. But there might be other things that the, the suppliers of those products have uh, in terms of their scale or the amount of support that they can offer or sort of the safety 
of sticking with those uh, suppliers that uh, causes businesses to not adopt what on paper might be a better product. Um, and so there, therefore that, you know, the innovation has to, has to, you know, be strong enough and, uh, and significantly better to get past some of those, those commercial barriers. And then on the financial side, you know, the first financial obstacle would be getting the funding to develop the innovation in the first place. And especially to get to that core technology stage. And, uh, you know, the, the, the financing is usually going to come, you know, in a, in a corporation. It's going to come from internal R&D budgets. Uh, it might come from uh, grants. Uh, it might come from venture capital. It might come from joint ventures. There might be a lot of different ways to get there. But the first obstacle really is to, is to find the money to get that core technology working. And then the second one would be, usually there's a bit of a gap between that very first article and then building the first article product. So going from that core technology to the first article products that you need to get them in the hands of early adopter customers to really prove that you've hit the mark. And sometimes there's an iterative process that occurs there where you, you build what's sometimes called the minimum viable product or a minimum viable prototype where you wanted to get just enough of the product done so that you can get it in the hands of customers and get uh, validation from them. And then the next financial obstacle is getting the funding to scale up the manufacturing, yeah, assuming you've demonstrated that the customers uh, are going to buy it. So then the, on the organizational side, um, you know, the obstacles, you know, might be competing priorities. There might be limited R&D resources or limited budgets, and your innovation might be competing with other innovations. And so you have to be able to really tell the story and advocate for your innovation versus other innovations. Um, and sometimes there's a bit of a uh, not admitted here syndrome that you have to deal with. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's just a, a tendency in organizations to to think whatever we have developed is better than what somebody else has developed. And that might be one department versus another department or one manager versus another manager. Or it might be a big company that doesn't want to license in that technology from a small company because there's a competing internal project. Um, and then I guess the other organizational obstacle that I've observed is sometimes it's sort of the inability of engineers or scientists to speak the language of business. Uh, at, at least enough to get the, the, the financing done and to, to get the thing out to the market. And, you, know, it, you, you know, you'll find in, in business that a lot of decisions get made not on the technical merit, but ultimately on those decisions about will customers buy this and can we produce this cheap enough. And those are, you know, those are discussions that, that that really are a blend of a technical discussion and a business discussion. And so, you know, it's, you know, the innovators need to either learn enough of the language of business to be able to, to speak that language, or they need to team up with um, partners, product managers, other people who can sort of be translators between those two regimes. Okay. Well, thank you, Ken, for uh, describing all the obstacles. We'll move on to our next panelist. Um, Eric, if you could briefly explain the creative process by which individuals come up with the ideas for new innovations. I know we kind of talked on this a little bit earlier, but if you could briefly explain the process. Uh, sure. I think uh, the first thing I have to say is, wow, you know, there are libraries full of books on this one. Um, and probably the best that I can offer in a few minutes here are some personal reflections, uh, which in fact might lead the audience to some of those books, uh, but reflections on some of the directions or avenues from which one might enter this creative process. Uh, because I think, uh, for me anyway, that's a key part of this. It's uh, where are you coming from? Uh, remember, again, this is about making a connection between knowledge, know-how, information, and a problem, and then using the right combination of uh, knowledge, know-how, and skills, as has already been talked about, to deliver a solution to the problem that somebody's going to care about. Uh, 
uh, now this may be an oversimplification, but I think it's got pedagogical value. You can come at it either from the knowledge side or the problem side. And the language that we use to discuss uh, innovation reflects this. Uh, for example, the MBA curriculum talks about technology push and or market pull. Well, technology push is, is coming at the creative process from the knowledge side. Market pull is coming at it from the problem side. Or we commonly refer to, quote, a solution looking for a problem, end quote. Or, quote, a problem looking for a solution. End quote. And I think there's uh, some real richness in thinking a little bit about the distinctions uh, in, uh, intrinsic in, in these two approaches. Uh, some will argue that one avenue is intrinsically better. That is, it's more successful at delivering innovations, as we defined innovation here, than uh, another. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I would assert that there are many examples of innovations that are the fruits of either approach. And I think that's what's important is appreciating the distinction and understanding the subtle differences because they are two different starting points. And therefore, to move forward from either one or another, you have to proceed a bit differently. And I think uh, in many cases, at least as we all have evolved from primarily an academic environment, I mean, that's where we first learn stuff, um, we tend to have the solution and look for the problem. And I think Paul made a very uh, useful specific suggestion uh, when he mentioned earlier that it's useful to go to conferences and trade shows and go to the uh, commercial folks and try to understand what problems they have. Um, because one can, can come at this, as I said, from either way. And there are many interesting cases that are, in my view, examples of either approach. Um, they have been, they will continue to be successful. They are worthy, I think, of some scrutiny and some study as case histories. And there, there are there are lots of them. Um, two that uh, occur to me uh, immediately here is uh, what's going on with uh, graphene, basically planar aromatic carbon, reflects a technology push. Uh, that's a solution looking for a problem. It's a new material. What can we do with this? Um, and research to date has just begun to stretch the surface on what might be possible. Uh, but certainly the, the folks who are, shall we say, in the graphene space are taking the uh, creative process approach that is, you know, I've got something, let me learn more and more about how this might be applied. Uh, <laughs> From the other side, uh, you know, a, a historically famous example of a problem that needed a solution was the problem of how to harness the energy uh, accessible by nuclear fission that was first addressed through the Manhattan Project. Um, that, if you like, was in fact a, a super strong market pool and uh, was responsive to a problem that desperately needed a solution at the time. So I'd close there for now and welcome follow-up question. Thanks, Eric. Our next question is for Paul. Paul, what should a faculty member or student prepare and bring to you to help facilitate a, the tech transfer process? Yeah, thanks, Blake. Uh, well, there's a couple things. Uh, I should first say that uh, talk to your tech transfer people kind of early in the process uh, because there are, again, at the end of the day from the university side, we need to license the technology to somebody, either a startup or an established company. Uh, and that, that technology will give them some sort of a competitive advantage. 
And there's numerous ways of that being done. One of those is through patents and copyrights and trademarks and trade secrets, uh, otherwise known as intellectual property. Um, at the university level, we don't do many trade secrets. People move around too much. Things are too fluid. Uh, we really don't do a whole lot of trademarking. We're seeing more and more copyright applications in the software space because it's hard to patent those these days. And we do a ton of patent applications. But there are different rules both in the U.S. and abroad, ex-U.S., uh, with regarding public disclosure of your invention or your idea um, and how you might be able to get patent coverage for that down the road. So if you publicly disclose your, your idea, and this could be a poster, it could be an abstract in enough detail, it could be a, uh, might be a talk at a conference uh, where people outside of your university are present, uh, and it could be a con private conversation in the absence of a confidentiality agreement. All of those actions uh, will negate you from getting patent coverage ex-US. In the US, you have one year uh, after that public disclosure to file a patent application, and you're still good. So it's a part of what drives that is business decisions. So if you've got a product in which a licensee needs worldwide coverage, uh, you don't want to blow your ex-US coverage. Uh, so you want to think about this ahead of time. So talk to your tra tech transfer people early about what you have, what you think it might be good for, who might be using it, uh, is there a global market, is it just a US-centric market, things like that. So uh, all the tech transfer offices, uh, So that and that can be an informal discussion. Uh, they'll be happy to speak with you. Uh, once you're ready to disclose this as an invention, we call it an invention disclosure form, uh, all offices have these, um, and they're fairly straightforward. They're usually pretty short, so it's a technical description of what it is. It's, uh, and you probably have to not necessarily new, need the excruciating detail. Sometimes it's a manuscript that's, you know, you're about ready to publish, uh, so it's got everything in it. Um, you can tag that onto it, but it's uh, you got to give the tech transfer person an idea of what what this is useful for. Oftentimes, the offices aren't very big. There may not be the breadth and depth of expertise sitting in the office that say, oh, yeah, of course, this is what this is for. Uh, you have to help them through that a little bit. So I'm a biology guy. So if I were to get a, a graphing <laughs> disclosure, I'd have to do some work on that. I'd depend on the researcher to tell me, hey, you know, where's this going? What's it good for? So anyway, uh, that's part of the description and the disclosure. Uh, you need to know the funding sources that help fund the work in your lab that were used to accomplish this. Some of the funding sources have strings attached to them, and the office will need to know what those strings are and what our ability is to license this and to whom to license this and, and what reach through sorts of uh, terms might be uh, associated with that funding source. Uh, kind of point out as best you can what that unmet need. What's this good for? You know, what's you know, what problem is this going to solve? And a lot of times, as, as Eric just said, you guys are way ahead of the curve in terms of market. Uh, you're coming up with new things. Uh, there is no market. We don't know what it's for. Uh, and so that's that's a challenge, frankly. But uh, as best you can, you know, help help guide uh, what you think that those applications may be. And lastly, you need to uh, know who your co-inventors are. Now, different schools do this different ways. Here at Washington U, we call them contributors, so they're not necessarily an inventor. Inventor is a legal legal definition that has, and Erica can go into this, uh, uh, interpretations to it. It's not the same as authorship. So there's something to be careful there. So you know, read the questions on the disclosure, fill them in appropriately, ask your tech transfer people. Uh, how to uh, what it means if you don't understand it, and there there are legal implications for these things. So get it. We want to get them uh, get these things right first, you know, early on. And then uh, lastly, uh, you know, just continue to talk to people. Talk to you know the state agencies like Ken's associated with. Talk to people like Eric. Uh, talk to your tech transfer people. Uh, have those conversations. You know, just what if? You know, can I do this? What do you think about that? You know, just kind of open end. You can have conversations with third parties without really spilling the beans of your invention. So 
uh, you know, do it in that manner. You know, just get some general feedback. Um, if you need to discuss this with another company, for instance, uh, uh, talk to your tech transfer people or somebody in your administration office there and get a confidentiality agreement signed between the two parties before you really spill the beans. So that'll protect your patent rights going forward if you haven't filed yet. So anyway, there's lots of nuances and implications there, but uh, kind of bottom line, talk to your tech transfer person fairly early in the process as, uh, as these things are developing. And I'll stop there. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you to all of our panelists for answering our general questions. We will now move on to the Q&A portion of our webinar. I invite the audience, um, if you have any qu questions for our panelists, um, please post your questions in the question dialog box of your control panel. Um, and I'll try to get through as many questions as possible in our allotted time. I'll start the general questioning with um, Eric. Uh, can you explain the role of intellectual property and its importance in the innovation process? Uh, sure, I'll take a shot at it. And uh, I would refer back to uh, some of Paul's remarks just concluded uh, because uh, actually, uh, he and a few things uh, that he just said and a few things Ken had mentioned earlier uh, really, really speak to it. Uh, intellectual property is, as the name suggests, it's property. It's an asset. And it's an intangible asset. You know, it's not a thing. Of course, it's very relevant to things but it's not in and of itself a thing. And often, especially at the beginning, which is what we're talking about here, innovation, all you've got is the, uh, the intellectual property, which is, as uh, Paul's comment suggested, are a combination of trade secret, trademark, copyright, and patent. And for the reasons that he mentioned, What's most germane to this this group, this audience, are are patents, um, <clears throat> and so they, in many ways, and the IP that they represent, are the foundation for the innovation, as least as we've defined it for purposes of this discussion, and. So far as it's the foundation, you know, in in many respects, it's the beginning and the end. You, you, it's necessary for sure. It's not sufficient to uh, innovation, including you know, commercial success in the end. But <clears throat> you got to have it, and so you want, particularly in the academic environment, to do as Paul suggested. You want to talk to the tech transfer folks early on because they, their staff, however large or small, is familiar with those, those issues of how do you establish intellectual property? How do you make sure that you don't inadvertently shoot yourself in the foot by virtue of early disclosure? And especially as the laws continue to evolve, um, recognizing that the laws may not evolve so quickly, but case law, which is interpreting the laws and deciding how they'll be applied, is continually evolving. Uh, you need to work with people who are current in that. I'll stop there. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Ken or Paul, anything to add? No, I, I, I'm... I'm happy with all those comments. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Okay, we'll move on to our next question. Um, and I think um, Eric and Paul might have touched on this earlier, but I'll address the question to Ken. Um, we, we've mentioned in the past that some inventions 
or innovations might just be an improvement on an older innovation. Um, what is sort of the process, you know, if you're adapting an innovation, what, what are, the, what's the process that we have to go through in order to, um, you know, see this new d development on an old technique or old um, innovation? You know, I think the, I think the key step in that is really understanding, not just thinking through, but also based on feedback from others, understanding um, any deficiencies that the, you know the, the current uh, product or process has. In other words, what's wrong with it? What's what's slow about it? What's hard about it? What's too costly about it? Um, and then sort of imagining how it might be better um, that would you know make it more useful uh, make customers happier with it um, and whenever there's a big enough gap there that that's an innovation space if if you could do something to you know make it significantly better than, than the old version enough that somebody's going to care and enough that somebody's going to invest in it uh, invest in the development and you know, there's a lot of costs associated with bringing a new product to market, not just the technical costs, the R&D costs and the manufacturing costs, but there are also marketing and sales and training and documentation costs. Uh, so you got to really understand how big is that gap between what the old product did and what an improved product might do. Uh, Eric or Paul, any other um comments that you would like to add? Well, I would add that uh, an improvement, depending on how you look at it, may sound like it's not necessarily that big a deal or that valuable, but just to note that most <laughs> patents issued today are issued on improvements. You know, there's very little stuff that is kind of de novo totally new, 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 new. And uh, yeah, things like that come along once in a while. Maybe graphene is an example. That's a composition of matter that didn't exist until its discovery not so long ago. But aside from that, uh, let's say this, there's no shame in improvements. And some improvements are really, really valuable, uh, as Ken noted, insofar as they really address a previously uh, unaddressed problem in something that's widespread and used a lot. In fact, you make a significant improvement in something that's already widespread and you by definition have a lot of value because you have a lot of established market. All right. Thank you, Ken and Eric. Um, our next question is for Paul. Paul, you mentioned um, in, in your last general questioning about, um, you, you know, we have to be very careful on the funding sources. Um, what happens if um, you're working on a project across multiple universities and all th maybe all three universities have, you know, say an intellectual property right to to that invention or that innovation. Um, how do you deal with that? Oh. Paul, Paul, there. Paul, are you still online? Okay, we, we may have lost Paul. Um, let me, let me find a new question here for one of the other panelists. Um, we're, we're actually reaching the top of the hour, so I'm, I think I'm going to go ahead and allow our panelists to provide a, uh, one to two minute, um, closing remarks and, uh, uh takeaway message. We'll start with Ken. Yeah, so I guess I would I would just kind of close with 
um, a, a couple of thoughts. So, you know, one is there are a lot of opportunities to be innovators. Uh, you can be an innovator in a lot of different sectors. It can be in public, it can be in private, it could be in big companies, it could be in small companies, uh, it could be in startup companies, it could be your own startup company. Um, and I think if you have the, you know, the right personality, it can be very rewarding. But also, you should recognize that it tends to be very hard. It tends to be something that you have to have a lot of determination to get uh, from the idea stage all the way to the stage where you have wide adoption of the of the ideas. Uh, the other thought would be that it's you know you should think of it as an iterative process. You you start off uh, with um, you know something minimal and you test it and you prove it in and then you iterate many times. Usually, it's many many iterations, both technical and market iterations, between uh, between the beginning and the end of the process. And it, another thought would be that I think of innovation as a contact sport. <laughs> it's not uh, usually something that happens just between the ears of one person, you know, sitting in their in front of their computer. Usually it involves uh, teams of people. Uh, and as has been mentioned before, you know, multidisciplinary people. It's usually a team of people, including technical people and business people, uh, who uh, can sort of speak at least enough common language to um, to think it all the way through. Uh, and then I guess my last thought would be, um, it could be a very fun career path. Um, you know, if you're the kind of person that has a lot of curiosity and you like problem solving and you uh, like collaboration, um, then I think you can definitely think of yourself as an innovator and you can think of your your career career path as being uh, on, you know one of being an innovator in in industry or in um, academia thanks Ken and we'll move move to Eric Eric if you could provide us with a take home message uh, yeah I'll uh, take a shot at that and if you don't mind I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with your uh, invitation uh, to comment in wrap up and just speak to a couple of things that occurred to me uh, on the basis of this uh, shared hour as to what uh, might think further on and one is to emphasize uh, something I have already said and others uh, spoke to as well, and that is especially those of us who by definition are at early stage in our career and uh, in an academic setting uh, do develop, do, do start thinking about problems. What makes a problem? Who has a problem? What types of problems are there? What types of solutions might you uh, envision even if you don't have any knowledge related to the problem. I think it's a mental uh, disposition to just be alert to problems and develop the skill in uh, understanding the nuances and the details of the problems. And this brings me to my second point, which is uh, I didn't speak it too explicitly. It's implicit in the whole conversation this hour. And that is the devil is in the details. The innovations and the value is obtained by appreciating detail and taking advantage of detail and overcoming the details of problems in ways that people have not previously done this. And so uh, you really got to know your stuff. And then you have to be rigorous and diligent about applying what you know. And if you're good at that and can successfully do that, you'll innovate. And if it's more difficult for you, you'll find that out really quickly. Um, and the other thing that I would add, uh, especially for those of us who come from science and engineering backgrounds, um, and Ken's uh, comment touched on this too, it's really key uh, to develop uh, communication skills and to become not just competent, but truly excellent in that regard, both especially verbal and written. Because in this day where you're working uh, in collaborative teams, when you're working in multidisciplinary situations, when the people you're working with are not necessarily all native English speakers, uh, you really, really have to become 
good at this, or let's say this, if you are good at this, you will be a much more effective innovator. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. And we'll move on to Paul. Paul, if you could provide us with a short closing remark. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I dropped off earlier. Uh, I'm not sure what I missed, but uh, uh, I would agree with uh, Ken and Eric. It's uh, innovation is is very collaborative. Uh, so get out there, uh, talk to people, network. Uh, easier said than done, and you know, we're working hard in the labs to get things accomplished. But uh, make the time to do it. Um, and at the end of the day, it's our faculty, students, postdocs that are from the university perspective are our best marketers. So you guys are out there speaking at conferences. There are industry people at conferences. Uh, don't be afraid to, you know, engage them. Talk to them. Hey, what are you guys working on? You know, they may or may not tell you, uh, but they're, you know, they're not going to spill the secret sauce. But uh, you'll get an idea of what the types of problems are they're trying to solve. So. Um, I'd encourage you strongly to get out there and network. Thanks, Paul. Well, um, we're now at the top of the hour and a little bit past. I would like to take this time to thank you, the audience, for joining us today and our guest panelists, Ken Vaughn, Eric Evett, and Paul Hippenmeyer, for giving us insights into the innovation process. I would also like to thank the members of the Student Council for Innovation who have helped put the webinar on. Uh, my colleagues Lauren Fulmer, Yvonne Avery, Ryan Manser, Ryan Frederick, Juan Carlos Ramos, Amanda Pauly, and Betty Maddox for helping to prepare the webinar. If you um, would like to hear today's webinar again, um, we will have recordings of this webinar and information about future events uh, made available at www.csmc.us and look at the events page. Uh, again, I'd like to invite you, if, if you've enjoyed today's webinar and would like more information, uh, you can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And again, that website is um, there in the center of the screen. Um, thank you for attending and have a great afternoon. And I'd like to thank our panelists again for uh, taking the time out of their day to um, give us information into um, the innovative process. Thanks again. Sure, our pleasure. Indeed.